Hello again my fellow Jetty users and in this video we are going to look at circular coupling of a pair of servos, a pair of functions. Uh, golly, what is this about? Well, I had a message from Martin uh, who is asking for help. He has bought a Bernreiter vectored thrust tube. I'd never heard of Bernreiter but I googled them and sure enough found Modelbau Bernreiter and they make vectored thrust tubes. And Martin sent me a photograph of the instructions, which I have done a drawing for you, which is basically, there were the instructions with some words saying, yeah, maybe you could use a sort of mixery thing to achieve this. And uh, what they want is the uh, thrust vectoring to move in a circle rather than in a square. In other words, if you apply full yaw and full pitch, it shouldn't go up to a corner there. It should follow round in a circle. Why? Well, they say that uh, extreme forces can occur in the corners, which may cause damage. And that's the extent of the instructions. No hint about, well, Here's an example of how to do it in, say, a Futaba or a JR or whatever, which might have given me something to try. So I've managed to do this. Um, but you may have an alternative way of doing it or a better way of doing it. And you may solve one of the problems I haven't solved yet. If you have, please tell me in the comments below. And if I can get it to work, we'll do a video and credit you with your wonderful uh, design here. What's the problem? Well, uh, suppose you move full yaw out to here with the stick and the servo follows out there. And so the uh, your little vectored thrust tube sitting in the middle comes out and sits out here. Lovely. You push on full pitch at the same time and uh, the pitch servo moves the uh, vectored thrust tube up to here. And what uh, Bernreiter are saying is, no, we can't have it going round the edges of the square. We need it to move in a circular path as you apply uh, combination of forces. So if you apply full yaw, you can come out to here, that's fine. But if you start applying the pitch, the, the vector thrust pipe cannot go up here in a straight line. It must follow around that curve and only come to here. OK, and then as you uh, reduce the yaw on it so it can come up around a curve here until you've got the full pitch. OK, now uh, designing a little program to do that in a straight line would be dead easy, no problem at all. But if you do that, you've lost all the possible travel inside there. Uh, so working out a way to do this really caused me some head scratching. And as I say, if you've got a just even an alternative or a better way of doing it, do let me know in the comments. What I'm going to do is just go through the programming of it and stick the numbers in. And if you just want to copy this and put the numbers in, it will work. Uh, and what I will do then afterwards is carry on and show you all the trigonometry required to come up with the numbers that I came up with. So if you want to understand why I'm using those numbers, I'll do it in the second part of the video or second part. I won't do a separate episode. I'll just put it at the end of this um, so that it, you, you don't have to sit through all the, the trigonometry if you don't understand it or find it boring or just want the numbers in. We'll go through the programming first. A couple of thoughts come to mind. If you're using a gyro with your vectored thrust, um, unless it's got some amazing programming in it, it's just going to go bang, 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 bang. It will not follow a circular path when it needs to use um, the two components. So how would you overcome that? Well, um, the simplest thing to do is uh, when you're programming your gyro, don't allow it 100% travel. Um, Inactivity alarm. Silence. Limit it to 71%. 71% travel. Because that 
uh, if we follow the 45 degree line, then 71% yaw and 71% pitch. And you won't exceed this point here. Um, yes, you'll end up having a gyro that can only work then in that box out of the whole thing. Uh, but at least it would stop it intruding into these corners. You'd lose these bits here, but then the gyro tends to work pretty fast and maybe not need it anyway. Uh, how you do that, it depends on the gyro you've got, how you teach it in, whether you can connect it up to software and, and reduce its travels, whatever, that's up to you and the gyro you're using. Another thought that comes to mind is the way that I've managed to get this to work is that this curve applies at any point rather than being a limit. So if you push on your yaw out to here and then start pushing in pitch, ideally what you want is that you could push more and more pitch all the way up until you meet the curve and then it would limit the pitch. Uh, but what's happening is that the, the sort of curve demixing is always working. So instead of going straight up there and keeping a constant yaw it will curve off a bit yeah and therefore the yaw will reduce as you push in pitch and you'll meet the curve somewhere up here so if you've got yaw in and you start to push in pitch the yaw will reduce if you've got pitch in and you start to push in yaw then the pitch will reduce. So there is a bit of decoupling going on, which is not ideal. If you have a way of solving that, great. Um, again, if it was straight line, dead easy, because the coordinates of a straight line, the X and the Y, always add up to a constant. But with a curve, it's the yaw squared plus the pitch squared equals the square of the radius. So if you take the square of the radius as a constant, um, because square of 100% would be 10,000. We're using percents as a whole number rather than the fraction. Um, so the value here would be 100 and 0, which gives you the 10,000. The value here would be 0 and 100, which gives you 1,000. But the value here is 71 on each of them. So they don't add up as 71s to a constant, but they do if you square them add up to the 10,000. And we can't program that in nice and easily. Uh, so that's why uh, we end up having a bit of a curve in all the time. Otherwise, we could easily make a logic switch that says when X and Y, or a pitch and yaw, mix together equal a certain number, only then does the mixer switch on. Right, enough of all this faffing about. Let's have a look. Now, uh, we're going to build up curves that reduce the travels as required. And there's two ways to use them. Uh, we can use the curve as the switch in the dual rate. So, for instance, we could take the pitch uh, dual rate and use the yaw uh, reduction curve as the proportional switch in the pitch dual rate and vice versa. In the yaw dual rate we can use the pitching reduction curve to reduce that. But that does take away your option to use the dual rate in the um, vector thrust for some other purpose. And there's two ways to switch off your vector thrust that I can think of. One is to use flight modes um, if you're using flight mode separate then on the vectored thrust, you can use function curve and you can use a constant zero function curve to switch off the vectored thrust. Or the other way is to set your vectored thrust dual rate to zero. But if you've used the vectored thrust uh, dual rates with the derating proportional switch, you can't do that. So the other way is to do it with mixing, and that's what Inactivity I've alarm. gone for. I must disable that one of these days. So the idea of this is we're going to mix 
the vector thrust pitch back to itself at minus 100%, so it effectively switches itself off. The, the output will remain locked at zero. But we'll use a special function curve from the yaw stick as the switch for that mix, so that uh, it proportionally mixes the, the switch on and out, uh, or on and off. Yeah, we'll have a look and see what happens. So let's pop in here into model, into our functions assignment. Here we've got the variable thrust pitch, which is the same stick as the elevator. Here we've got the variable thrust yaw, which is the same stick as the rudder. And then we've created a couple of virtual functions. I call them virtual because although course the system would like to assign a servo to them we don't assign a servo if you've done this in the uh, setup wizard just delete the servos that it creates and these are the variable thrust pitch decrease which you notice we've assigned here actually to the yaw stick and the variable thrust yaw decrease which we've assigned to the elevator stick okay and so we okay to that. And in our servos, of course, we've got the elevator and the rudder. We've got the variable thrust pitch and we've got the variable thrust yaw. Okay. Um, come down to fine tuning into free mixes. And we've created two mixers, one for the pitch and one for the yaw. And in each of them, we're mixing it back to itself. So let's have a look in here. So we're set variable thrust pitch to variable thrust pitch. The master value is minus 100%. So it mixes itself out. It will never move out of zero, except for the fact that we can assign a switch. And rather than just an on-off switch, we have assigned a proportional switch, and that proportional switch is the variable thrust yaw decrease. So we're in the pitch mixer, but we need it to decrease as we move the yaw stick. And in the other mixer, which was the variable thrust yaw, getting rid of to variable thrust yaw, the switch is the pitch, variable thrust pitch decrease. Let's have a look in here. Okay, so come across here. U3. Let's have a look at it. We'll clear it out. Say plus. Come down here. Function. Now, it's the variable thrust yaw decrease because we're in the pitch to pitch mixer and we want yaw to decrease the pitch as we move them in. Okay. So, we okay to that. Okay, dokie there. Have I just picked the wrong one? Yes, I want the pitch decrease. Silly me. Clear plus. I want the pitch decreaser because the pitch decreaser uh, is taking its signal off the yaw stick. I'll move the rudder stick. There we go. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, let's have a look at what that actually is. Function curve, come down here. The variable thrust pitch decreaser, which is actually assigned to the rudder stick or the yaw stick. Let's take a look at the curve. Here is the curve for the function. It's a nine point curve. And let's go in and take a look at the values. So the first value is 29%. Next value, 20%. Next value, 11%. Next value is 3%, 0%. And then it goes back out the other side of it. 3%, 11%, 20%, and 29%. And what we'll be doing then, if I move the uh, yaw stick, rudder stick, you'll see our target moves around. So that proves this is... It's the variable thrust pitch decrease assigned to the yaw stick, and it's following this curve. Now, it is actually a curve with those values, and I said I'll explain later on in the trigonometry how it's done, or how they're calculated. So we say okay to that, but notice 
that um, we'll go back and have a look. With the yaw stick at the centre, the value is zero. With the yaw stick out to the side, the values increase. And if we use that as the switch in the mixer, or the demixer, it is really, then what we're saying is that uh, pitch mixes to itself at minus 100%, but with the yaw stick in the middle at zero, the mixer is off. So the, the minus 100% pitch mix is off, and all you're left with is pitch. And as we move the yaw stick out, that minus 100% goes from zero out to the 29 there. So as we move the yaw stick, the uh, minus mixing starts to come in. And that's what does the job. And we do the same thing, exactly the same, for the vector thrust yaw decrease. Same curve, same numbers. This one is working off the pitch stick. And again, uh, it's acting as the switch. So this is the rate of the switch of switching on that mixing back to itself at minus 100%. So it's actually zero of 100%, the zero. So the, the mixer is effectively off. And if we push in full pitch, we'll get 29% uh, mixing back to itself, switching off. Okay. And that is then what gives you your beasts in here. Let's edit it. So there's U3. This is the pitch to pitch mixed minus 100%. And here is, as you can see, just a little movement. I'm moving the, the yaw stick the full way. See, 29, 29%, because that's what we put in the switching curve. And the result of that is, well, here are, I'll switch that off. Here is the, the pitch, uh, sorry, elevator servo. Here is the yaw servo. Now, if I switch the flight mode on so that the vectored thrust works, again, now we've got elevator and vectored thrust pitch. You see they move together. Now we've got rudder and vectored thrust yaw. You see they move together. But if I push on full yaw, watch what happens to that as I start moving the pitch. See, it's reducing and they reach a maximum both of 71%, which is the sign of the 45 degree angle. Remember I told you to set up your gyro maximum 71%? Follow around a curve, 71%, there we go. Now, I'll start to reduce the yaw, which is this one, and watch the pitch increase up towards 100 as we do so. There we are. Now I'll push the yaw into the left. See the pitch is decreasing until they're both at maximum stick, 71%. And with the full yaw in, I'll start reducing the elevator as we go around the circle, or pitch anyway, and see the yaw increasing to minus 100% fully out to the left. I'll start pulling the pitch back. The yaw is decreasing. And now I'll start reducing the yaw and the pitch increases out to its maximum. And that, dear viewers, is how we get there, the vector pipe moving around that circle instead of around the square. OK, it works. And as you saw, as I switch, had it at the start there, I had the uh, the flight mode switch in the vectored thrust off setting. So in case you're wondering how we do, do that, uh, we come up here. Uh, I've got my, I've just made two flight modes, thrust vectored on, thrust vector off with the switch. Came to function curves, vectored thrust pitch and vectored thrust yaw, set them to separate. You go into their curve, and then if you look, 
thrust vectoring is on, leave it as a standard curve, thrust vectoring off, change it to a constant curve because in each flight mode we've got completely different curve. So that locks it out there. Or as I said, rather than do that, if you don't want to do that by flight modes, you can come to your dual rate expo, come to your vectored thrust pitch, simply set the switch there with a 0% when you want it to do nothing and it'll bring that curve down. Okay, so my goodness, it all works. Now, for those of you who are a bit anoraki like me and enjoy a good bit of trigonometry, here is how I got to the values that we use. Um, if you're not into this and you just wanted the program to work uh, or see how it works, uh, off you go, have a beer now, because we need to do our trigonometry. And this is a graph of our stick positions. Now, just to make it easy, imagine you've got your elevator and rudder on the same stick, i.e. pitch and yaw on the same stick. Some of you will have if you fly a particular mode. Um, it just makes it easier to visualise this all stick position at the same time. So, uh, you move your yaw stick all the way out there. There's where uh, the stick's going to be. That's where the yaw servo is going to be, and that's where the vectored thrust pipe is going to be. Or, from stick at middle, you move it all the way up in pitch, then that's where the stick's going to be, that's where the pitch servo will be, and that's where your vectored thrust pipe is going to be. But because we've programmed in a curve now, what happens if you push the stick up into that corner? Well, that's where the stick's going to be, uh, and that's where your elevator and rudder servos are going to be, but your vectored thrust pitch servo uh, can only have come up to this height here, and your vectored thrust yaw servo can only have come along to this point here, because they're following round the curve. Now, how then do we find the values to put in our nine-point curve for this? Uh, well, first of all, um, we could split this up. We're only really concerned about this bit here because this is the reverse of this bit. We could split this into four segments of equal angles, 45 degrees, so they're going to be, what, 11 and a quarter degrees each, in which case we would have to calculate what percentage of stick movement that equates to because it's actually going to be all different. You know, as the angles come out here, the gap along here gets bigger. And we can do it that way, because Jetty allows us in multipoint curves to not only move the up and down value, but also the side to side value. So you wouldn't be at 25, 50, 75, 100, you'd have to move these in a little bit. The other way to do it is calculate what is the angle here at 25%, 50%, 75%, and 100%. And then when we come to program the uh, nine-point curve in the jetty, all we have to do is move the up and down value because the points will already be at 25, 50, 75, 100, and so on. So all we have to do is move the up and down bit. So either way, we've got to do a bit of trigonometry. We either fix the angle at uh, one quarter of this, which is 11 and a quarter degrees, and then calculate what these numbers would be, and then we have to move them sideways in the jetty curves, or we fix these distances, which is the default uh, numbers that jetty will use in its curve, and uh, then calculate these angles. So either way, we've got to do a calculation, but uh, one method allows us to just leave those numbers there as they are, in the jetty curve, so that's what I'm going to do. So, uh, nice bit of trigonometry. Do you remember from your school days, Sokatoa? The sine of an angle is the opposite over hypotenuse. The cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, and the tangent is the opposite over the adjacent. What have we got here? Well, I want to find what is this angle here for this point here. So, what I've got is a right angle triangle, which means we can use Sokotoa, because it, it only works with right angle triangles. Uh, 
And I want to find this angle here. I know this distance here, it's the 25. I know this distance here, it's the 100. Yeah? So from that angle there, I know the opposite. I know the adjacent. I don't know the hypotenuse and I don't care. So that tells me that it's the tangent. The tangent of that angle is the opposite, which is 100, over the adjacent, which is 25. For this point here, this is going to get messy in a little while, isn't it? This point here, the tangent of that angle will be the opposite, which is again 100, over the adjacent, which is 50. And for this one, it'll be 100 over 75. And for this one, 100 over 100, which is 1. Um, so the tangent of that angle is 4, the tangent of that angle is 2, the tangent of that angle is 1.33, and the tangent of that angle is 1. So taking the arc tangents, we can find the angles. That one, which we already knew, this one, 100 over 100, 45 degrees. That comes to 53 degrees, that comes to 63 degrees, and that comes to 76 degrees. Okay, what do we do with that? Well, what we now want to know is the height at each of these points on the curve. And that, dear reader, is a sine function. Because if we take this one here, we now know the angle of this one. That's 76 degrees to this line here. We know the hypotenuse because now we're coming around the curve. We know the hypotenuse is 100. And uh, we want to find what that height is. And therefore, we have uh, the angle. We have the... Let me think, quickly think. We have the angle. We have the hypotenuse. And what we want to do is find the height opposite that angle. So that's sine. So sine of this angle will be the height of the opposite divided by the hypotenuse. We know the angle, we know the hypotenuse, so we can get that. And therefore, the sine of each of these angles, <clears throat> 45 degrees is 0.71, 53 degrees, 0.8, 63 degrees, 0.89, and 0.97. So the height at each of these points is 0.97, 0 0.89, uh, yeah, 0 0.89, 0 0.8, and 0 0.71. Ooh, sorry, I'm not showing you with the camera. The height, 0 0.97, 0 0.89, 0 0.8, 0 0.71. Okay, and if we just treat those then as whole numbers rather than the fractions, uh, it's 71, 80, 89, 97. Uh, what we actually need to know, though, is the gap here, from 100 down to there. Yeah. So we can do 1 minus the sine, which gives us 0.29, or 29%, 20%, 11%, and 3%. Does that sound familiar? Those were the numbers we programmed the height of the curve, because now we know that at the 25% point, we want 3%. When we've travelled 50%, we want a 20% difference. When we've travelled 75, uh, we've got that point there, which is on the 45 degree line, or near enough 45 degree point, and blah blah blah. So you've got 11 and 3. And that that's how we came up with the numbers to put in the curve. Now, you might think, this is a bit odd, uh, when we start getting around here, the numbers should change pretty rapidly coming downwards, uh, and they don't seem to be any change. For example, uh, from up first movement to 25%, the value only changes 3. The next value because it's gone from 0 to 3. The next value is another 25%, and the value changes by 
8. The next 25, the value changes by 9. And the next 25, the value changes by 9 again. Shouldn't it be changing a lot more rapidly? Aha. Uh -huh. But it would do if we'd chosen the uh, fixed angles of 11 and a quarter degrees. But we chose to fix this point, which means that the points on the curve are not evenly distributed. They close up here compared to up here. And that's why the height value doesn't appear to change so much. Actually, our points here are uh, closing up in that value. Okie doke, that's probably enough uh, getting brain fade now. So, hope you enjoyed that and we'll see you some other time.